So, good morning everyone. Aren't you glad to be here? I am. The, the praise and the worship here is just, as we would say in the States, off the chain. <laughs> it is something else. It is not the usual one. Amen. So, quickly, I pray that I will be able to finish my message today. <laughs> I don't want to be long, but, you know, go to Revelation chapter 3, verse four, beginning at verse 14. And I, this is a message that has been in my heart, and I've been sharing this all over the place, even in Bible studies. So, to those of you who, who, who will not be in the Bible studies that I've, I've been sharing, but I would like to share with you from Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Okay, let's begin reading verse 14, chapter 3, Revelations. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, This thing says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, the same, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Ang naay igdulungog maminaw. Amen? Hallelujah. Now why am I sharing with you about the church in Laodicea? I am teaching on the church of Laodicea because in the times that we live in, we could easily be like it if we do not watch out. Speaking even just of Cebu, you and I have noticed how much it has changed. Well, this past week, we had our class reunion. We had yellow shirts, t-shirts on, and emblazoned were bold, dark letters, and we went, visited the University of San Carlos Technological Center, and it says on our shirt, CHE 74. 41 years ago, I finished chemical engineering. And I said that just to highlight that 41 years ago, Cebu was not what you see it now. All where we live, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge my, the presence of my mother-in-law. I don't have my biological mother now, but I still have my, my lovely mother-in-law here. And uh, where, where we are, where we are was just all cornfields. I think, Grace, you will remember that, you know, that Doña Rita village was not like that before, right? And so, uh, so much building have been constructed, so many cars like I've never seen. I think you have even more, uh, more models of cars here than we have in the States. And of course, the resulting traffic jams that has made our commutes longer and quite frustrating. This city and the adjoining ones have progressed and prospered. Cebu is booming. And with it, the, and with the advancement in technology, the smartphones, iPads, computers, TV entertainment, social media, all these take our attention and our time, correct? Mm -hmm. Our pursuit of these material things and pleasure, and even just trying to meet our needs, takes so much of our time. Sadly, the pursuit of material things, the pleasure, and just even trying to earn to sustain our families can take a toll on our relationship with God. 
All this can affect us so that we may be in danger of getting the same rebuke that the church in Laodicea received in uh, Revelations 3.16, where Jesus said, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I do not think that there would be any of us here that would like to hear that from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You don't want to hear that said of any one of you. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I wouldn't want that said of me, and neither would I want it said of any of you. Of the seven churches to which the epistle of the Revelation was written for, only two, Smyrna and Philadelphia, did not get a rebuke or any negative comments from our Lord Jesus. The rest of the five, Ephesus, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicea, re received rebukes and warnings. Of the five churches that our, lo our Lord called to get their act together, Laodicea is the one which William Barclay commented. Laodicea has the grim distinction of being the only church which the recent Christ had nothing good to say. Can you imagine that? The only church of the seven that God or Jesus had nothing good to say. We don't want that, right? Have you ever considered what Jesus would say about yourself personally? There is a problem that consumes us or many today. They like to hear what others say about them. Amen? And so they spend so much time gathering likes in Facebook. Have we considered how God thinks of us? Are we more concerned about the perspective of man rather than God's point of view? We should be pursuing the like of God rather than our friends. In our desire to make friends in Facebook, let us be careful we have not unfriended God. Amen? Every church that our Lord Jesus evaluated, he said this at the end of the seven churches all of them had something in common. He said this at the end. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today? Or do you hear what the Spirit is saying about you today? Or are we too busy? Thus, I picked the study of the church of Laodicea, who is known to be the lukewarm church. Now, let's look at the background of this church. Laodicea, the last of the seven churches addressed in Revelation, was located at the crossroads from the highway east to west. There were six cities in the ancient world that was called Laodicea, but this one was called Laodicea on the Lycos to distinguish it from others. It was founded in 250 B.C. by Antiochus of Syria and named that place after his wife, Laodis. It was one of the tri-cities located on the Lycos River Valley together with Colossae, Hierapolis, but Laodice Laodicea was the premier city. So there was a, a region where three cities were located. To the north, Hierapolis. To the south, Laodicea. And maybe to the west, or was it to the east, was Colossae. The road, therefore... Uh, the, the, the good thing going for Laodicea was that the highway from Ephesus, if you look at your map later on, Ephesus faces Greece. And Greece, of course, is located behind, um, uh, behind Greece, is located Europe. So Ephesus was an entry point if uh, people would like to go travel into the Asia Minor. They would first go through Ephesus, but that road would take them through Laodicea. And so this was a plus to them. Its location would have been enough to make Laodicea one of the great commercial and strategic centers of the ancient world. Ramsay is quoted to say, It only needed peace to make Laodicea a great commercial and financial center. That peace came with the dominion of Rome. So Rome did something good for them. Built the highways and also established peace. 
The Roman soldiers and the Rome made sure that the bandits and the outlaws were taken care of and there was peace and business thrived. Together with the Roman peace came the opportunity to become, as Pliny described it, a most distinguished city. Now Gordon Fee writes of Laodicea, it was, it was also an extremely wealthy city, a fact noted in three kinds of deliberate and in incidental ways throughout ancient history and literary remains. It had become famous for three reasons in particular. So the three things made Laodicea very famous. First of all, and uh, first, first, for all practical purposes, they were the Swiss bankers of antiquity. So Gordon Fee cons considers Laodicea as the Swiss bankers of the old times, which meant that it was a city of considerable wealth. Second, they were famous for a breed of sheep, sheep that produced an extremely fine and desirable black wool. And third, their proximity to the hot springs across the river made them a kind of medical center famous worldwide for a specially mixed eye salve. So three things, commercial center, it was famous for a breed of sheep that had black soft wool that became a very coveted fabric and it was a medical center at that time and famous for some kind of an eye ointment, okay? Chuck Swindoll writes, also highlighting the affluence, financial capacity, and distinction of Laodicea. He said, devastated by an earthquake in AD 60, the city of Laodicea chose to put, pull, uh, pull it itself by its own bootstraps rather than seek imperial, as, imperial assistance like its neighbor. Philadelphia had done earlier. So in AD 60, a powerful earthquake hit the area. And the worst affected cities were Laodicea and Philadelphia. But Phil, uh, Philadelphia was not as rich as uh, Laodicea. So they asked help from the Roman Empire. And the Roman emperor at that time said, Okay, for the next five years, we will not collect taxes from you. Use that money to rebuild that city, but not Laodicea. They said, No, 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 we can do it ourselves. By saying that they pulled their own bootstraps, it is like us, you don't need help putting on your shoes, okay? So they said it though in such a way that was rather arrogant, no? So because of its location on the important Asian trade routes, Laodicea quickly became one of the wealthiest cities in the region, a condition reflected in the membership of the church. This time, Swindoll compares it, not unlike Wall Street, Laodicea was a major trading center in Asia Minor. So whereas Gordon Fee calls it the Swiss bankers of that time, Chuck Swindoll says they were like Wall Street. Now you can just imagine they were in there. This meant it attracted people of means. Money flowed freely through its streets and reflected in its buildings, in its business, and yet it also, and yes, also in church. So as I come here, and I, I am thankful that, you know, uh, Cebu has progressed. Every time I come here, I see buildings going up, being built, and I am happy for that. But on one hand, also, let us be careful because there is such a strange phenomenon that is seen in the seven churches in the study in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelations. Like city, like church. You will observe this, and I pray it won't be with us. So, William Barclay commented, it was a great center of clothing manufacture. Now, this was uh, the place where if you wanted fashion, if you wanted clothing, that was the place. Swindoll continues his observation. Besides these things that pump money into Laodicea's economy, the city was also famous for its medicine. In fact, some of their coins were minted with the faces of famous physicians from this city. This was especially known for, they were especially known for their Phrygian powder, okay? A powder, a substance mixed with water and used to treat ailments of the eye. 
It is no surprise that Christ's message to Laodicea refers to their wealth, their clothing, and their healing ointment. So, in spite of all this, there was one major problem that Laodicea had. However, Laodicea had one major problem. It lacked a supply of good water. They didn't have nature spring at that time, okay? Which eventually led to the city's abandonment. Can you imagine that? Ultimately, people abandoned the city. A rich city, thriving business center was abandoned. Why? Because of good, uh, of lack of good water supply. Their problem was not just having their own source of water, so they did not have their own source of water. Water flowed. They had to channel water from Colossae. Colossae had cold springs. On the north, Hierapolis had hot springs, but they would channel this through a, a system of aqueduct, and by the time the hot springs, the hot water got to them, it was already lukewarm. And by the time the cold springs got to them, it was also lukewarm. Okay? So, how bad was their water? Craig Keener gives us some idea. Laodicea boasted great resources. But while the Laodicean Christians likely shared their Laodicean neighbor's pride over self-sufficiency in many respects, they presumably also shared a common dislike uh, for their water supply. The bad situation of Laodicea's water was well known. Ancient sources are explicit about that. That though uh, that their water, maybe because of being lukewarm, it was more drinkable in terms of temperature than the ones in Hierapolis, but it was not really good tasting. Excavation of the city's terracotta uh, pipes uh, revealed thick lime de deposits, which suggest heavy contamination in water supply. Lime deposits on the water cliff just opposite Laodicea would, if you would look at a waterfall nearby, you would see that the walls where the waters flowed was white or grayish because of the deposit of, I presume, cal calcium carbonate. So a little chemistry will help us to understand how distasteful the Laodicean water was. Lime, also called burnt lime or calcium oxide, is a white grayish matter, odorless, lumpy, very slightly water-soluble uh, solid, when, but when combined with water, it can dissolve slowly in little contents, but when combined with water, it would form calcium hydroxide, slake lime. It is a base. It is an alkali solution. Lime water is the common name for the diluted solution of calcium hydroxide, but a pure calcium hydroxide solution would be really a little bit smelly and also bitter. So I am looking at this and say, because of this mineral deposits in there, some calcium hydroxide would be formed and therefore the water did not, uh, the water was not only lukewarm, but it also uh, was a little bit bitter. Okay, now how many of you are coffee drinkers here? How many of you drink tea? You like it when it's still steaming hot, right? But once it cools down to be lukewarm, you don't want to drink it anymore, right? And you want cold calamansi juice. You know, one of the things that I enjoy coming here is when I go to the restaurant, they ask me, sir, what would you like to drink? What would you like to order? I'd say, oh, I'd love calamansi juice. But don't, don't mix the sweetness, uh, the, the sweetener. I'll do it myself. They have the tendency to pour everything in. It's so sweet. So the waiter would say to me, Sir, calamansi juice, hot or cold? I said, you'll kill the vitamins if you uh, you know, order hot. <laughs> so I'm always amused with that. You know, but I like cold calamansi. Then like any juices, cold when it gets lukewarm, you don't like it anymore. You're getting the picture? So Craig Keener continues, Laodicea's lack in its own water supply had no direct access to cold water of the mountains or the hot springs nearby in Hierapolis. In contrast to its self-sufficiency, it had to pipe in water through much of the aqueduct. See, they were so self-sufficient in many things, 
But there was one thing that they lacked. They didn't have good, adequate water supply. Okay? So, for all its wealth, it could produce neither healing power of water like the neighborhood Hierapolis nor the refreshing cold water in Colossae, but merely lukewarm water, useful only as an emetic. Now, you know what that is, right? Emetic means something that is used para pampurga. Okay? So their water was so distasteful and lukewarm that it was practically only good for drinking it if you wanted to vomit. Okay? It was good for purgative purposes. Okay? Uh, so, now, so you have the problem of Laodicea, but there was also a big problem with the Laodicean church. What was the problem of the Laodicean church? Remember the pattern here. What you see, the characteristic of the cities, you also see it in the churches. Be careful. Uh, Revelations 3, 15 to 16. Jesus said, I know your works that you are neither uh, cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So what were they famous for? Well, they were famous for a brand or a kind of, of clothing material made of black sheep's wool, and they were famous for an eye salve, treating eyes. But Jesus said, on the other hand, the way I look at you, you are miserable, you are poor, blind, and naked. I want you first to notice this phrase also repeated at the beginning of the Lord's evaluation of each of the seven churches. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. This phrase, I know your work, is repeated in all or in all of the seven churches, okay? The reason our Lord could evaluate the seven churches then and the reason that he can today is as he claimed, I know your works. Nothing escapes our Lord's notice, okay? He knows everything that's going on in every church and in every individual. How does he know all things? We go back to chapter 1 where John gets a revelation of Jesus, our risen Lord, in all his splendor. Remember, this was around AD 90, where John was uh, exiled in the island of Patmos. Earlier, one of the Roman emperor decided that he would erase or get rid of all the leaders, of, especially those of the original 12 apostles. And the last one remaining was John. So they arrested him and tried to boil him in oil. Put him in boiling oil. But you see, nothing happened. That's what tradition says. And so instead, they exiled him. So AD 90, and this is almost 60 years from the last time that he saw Jesus. And the last time that he saw Jesus, Jesus looked like an ordinary person, right? Ordinary man. He was the son of a carpenter. He was dressed and clothed like one of the village people. He mingled with the poor. He was compassionate. And yet, he spoke with authority, taught with authority, performed miracles, and healed the sick, raised the dead, and would always come in conflict with the Pharisees and the religious people. But he looked like an ordinary person. But now, when John in the island of Patmos gets a glimpse of who Jesus is, he sees him now differently. He was not like anymore the ordinary village man that he was used to. So, in chapter 1, verse 12, I turned around to see the voice of the one speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstand was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down his feet with golden sash around his chest. And the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. 
His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held the seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. Now, I want you to understand, John saw a vision of Jesus. It does not mean that if you, we see Jesus again, that when he speaks, sword will come out of his mouth. No. But there is a vision and the revelation is so full of symbols that you have to understand what it means. No? So for example, at the same time, John describes whom he saw as someone dressed in Israel. So initially, instead of being dressed like an ordinary village person, they, he saw Jesus uh, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash. The full length tunic and the sash tells us that the glorified Christ, the Son of Man, is also being presented as the great high priest. No longer the son of a carpenter, but the great high priest. The hair of his head described as white as wool or as white as snow. That doesn't mean Jesus grew old. Okay? Uh, it means it's, this is similar to Daniel's vision of the Son of Man in chapter 7, verse 9. As I look, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels uh, were all ablaze, where it described the Ancient of Days as a reference to God the Father, as certified by the submission of the one like the Son of Man. So by giving the description of the Ancient of Days to Jesus, John is portraying the divinity of Christ and also His absolute purity. Okay? So the meaning of the white uh, hair and the glowing face is like that of Daniel chapter 7 and simply portraying the divinity or the deity or that Jesus is also God and his absolute purity. Now let's go to the eyes. This is the feature that is really, for me, if you ask me, scary about Jesus. Christ's eyes were like blazing fire. Again, in the language of Daniel 10, 6, chapter 10, verse 6. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze. You will find a similar, uh, what, what uh, Daniel saw is what also uh, John saw. So what does this mean? Okay. Therefore, Jesus who sees all things, um, all things we do and even knows what we think. You know, in other words, the flaming fire represents that Jesus can see and know all things. Amen? Right? It's not Santa Claus who knows when you're sleeping or awake. It is Jesus. And therefore, you know, we ought not to be afraid. You only ought to be afraid if you're doing something hidden and bad. But if you're honest with God, you don't have to be afraid. But if you're doing something bad, you think you can hide it from your wife, you think you can hide it from your husband, you think you can hide it from the police or the government or anybody, there is one person we cannot hide from. His name is Jesus. And not only that, He even knows what you're thinking. Your motives. For example, if we, you help a person, Ako ning tabangan kay para makautang ni nakog kabubuton. Why do you help a person? So that he will be indebted to you? So that later on, aha, ako na po'y maningil. No. Jesus sees that motive. If you help, it is because he or she needs help. Period. And you want to do it with the heart of Christ. So I'm mentioning this because when you see, uh, when you read that, Jesus has blazing eyes of fire. It means that he can see all things. And this should help us live and walk the narrow straight line. Amen? Okay? Now, moving on. So, verses 15 to 17 tells us that Christ's knowledge of the deeds or works of the Laodicean church, and as Gordon Fee tells us, the primary feature is the considerable difference between what they think they are and who Christ knows they are 
and which Christ reveals in his letter. So what does it mean? The, the thing that we really see here in this uh, verses 15 to 17 is, you know, the Laodicean church saw themselves one way, but Jesus saw themselves another way. They thought they were rich. They thought they were doing okay. Maybe if you compare their church today, they had the most magnificent building. Oh, they didn't have these plastic chairs. They were probably cushiony, reclining seats. It was so comfortable, everybody slept when the preacher spoke. Right? <laughs> and they thought that they were so rich. They were, you know, and, but you know what Jesus said? No, you're not rich. You're so poor. You're bankrupt. No. You, you may have the eye solved, the uh, ointment for treating, but you're blind. You cannot even see your need. And no, you are not well clothed with all the branded clothes. Like I said, I like my favorite brand, uh, brand is Guadini, Gawadini, okay? Okay, so I said, no, you are not. You are, in fact, naked. Yeah, remember, they were famous for their clothing, okay? So, I know your works. And that is why, you know, that is why we ought not to be pursuing the flippant assessments of the likes in Facebook. We should be concerned with what Jesus has to say about us. You're pursuing and pursuing and pursuing all the likes. You have no time for Jesus. Okay, okay, okay. First, verse 15. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. This probably is a reflection on the fact that they were across the river from hot springs, so, uh, from hot springs so that by the time the water reached them, uh, Laodicea, it was lukewarm, it was insipid or without taste, it was not pleasing for food or drink, not useful for medicinal nor drinking purposes. Again, I want to cite Keener explains lukewarm water. The point of lukewarm water is simply that it is disgusting. In contrast to the more directly hot and cold water, all churches would plainly understand this warning. Hot water, as long as it was not too hot, was useful for bathing. Waters at, waters at hot springs uh, nearby Hierapolis uh, was helpful for relieving ailments. Cold water was useful also for drinking but not the water of Laodicea. So again, Swindoll says, by the time it reached the city, the water was always tepid, lukewarm, and sometimes even bitter or chalky. You like water that tastes like chalk? To the taste after traveling miles through all that stone. Like their municipal water, Laodicea's work was lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. Now, we ask the question, what does it mean when Christ wished that the Laodiceans were either cold or hot than lukewarm? There is the tendency to think that hot refers to zeal or fervor, enthusiasm, and even diligence of individuals or church for, uh, for, for Jesus and the gospel. You know, one of the things I really like coming here is when we start praising and worshiping the Lord, man. Everybody is really into it. Amen? And that's the way it should be. Not that we all should jump five feet altogether. No, but you can really see that people here are really giving their heart during worship. Amen? Give yourselves a hand. Hallelujah. Amen. But Warren Wiersbe explains it this way. In the Christian lives, there are three spiritual temperatures a burning heart on fire for God. And there is also a cold heart and a lukewarm heart. The lukewarm Christian is comfortable. Listen to this. This is what it means to be lukewarm. The lukewarm Christian is comfortable, complacent, and does not realize his need. If he were cold, at least he would feel it. Both the cold water from Colossae and the hot water from Hierapolis would be lukewarm by the time it was piped to Laodicea. You know what's the danger of being lukewarm? Because if you're hot for the Lord, you will know it, right? 
And people will know it. Oh man, I would like to be like, like him or her. They, they, this, these guys are really hot for the Lord. You can really see it. Now, if somebody is also cold, you can also know. <laughs> you can also tell, ah, bugnaw pa na sa yellow, no? Okay? <laughs> but, when a person is lukewarm, there's the danger. He thinks he's hot, but he's not hot enough. Right? And so that's the danger of being lukewarm. So he thinks, ah, okay, rako. You know, he becomes complacent. He becomes, you know, uninvolved. He does not care. Ah, hindi lang na silang worship team. Kay worship team na sila. Ah, ngayon na silang mainiton. Let the worship team and those people who are here in front do the dancing and all that. But these are not just outside forms. These are expressions of the heart. Remember what Jesus said? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so, uh, that's the danger of being lukewarm. However, you know, but, but, uh, uh, but one, of the, um, one of the commentators also said, if it were about passion, really good thing is just about passion, no? Or you're, you, know, you know what I mean? Because lukewarm is better than cold if it were about passion. But it is simply their attitude and their actions born out of a heart that is, that is self-reliant, that is complacent, and so on. Amen? But you know, I thought about this, but when I read verse 17, Therefore, be zealous and repent. Wiersbe is right about his remark of burning heart on fire for the Lord in describing hot Christians. Zealous means ardently active, devoted or diligent, and its synonym is or are enthusiastic, eager, fervent, or intense. It's hard for me to imagine a follower of Christ who is hot without reference to being enthusiastic, active, devoted, and involved in the works of the kingdom. You know, to, ha to, be, to be a hot Christian it is hard for me to imagine that you can be, you consider yourself hot Christian and you don't care what's going on in the church. You may be giving your tithes. By the way, your tithes don't even belong to you, right? So you're just giving what belongs to God. And so, you know, uh, you cannot even boast. We cannot even boast of that. But what, I, uh, what I'm trying to say is, hey, if you are on fire for God, you may not jump five feet when we worship and praise, but you will be there. You will be involved. You care what's happening in the church. You care for the lost. You want to be involved in, 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 in sharing the gospel and in doing things in the church that would help the purposes of God in this generation. Amen? So, the point of the rebuke of Jesus, I want you to understand, is not being rich. Kinsa may dato na to dere. See, Akura. Okay. So, the point is not about being rich. There is nothing wrong about being rich. Ay, salamat. We all, in fact, want to be rich. Abe, who wants to be rich? Ako lang yapon? <laughs> no. It is not being rich that's the problem here. It is what riches did to them or what the Laodicean church allowed wealth to do to them. Okay? Riches or money is not the problem. It is what they allowed wealth or money to do to them. Okay? Chuck Swindoll continues, Sadly, Christians today aren't immune to the disease of self-reliance. Okay, when... And this is a natural observation. A lot, I've seen this repeated. People can come to church, Oh, pastor, please pray for me. My business is not doing well. And we pray, okay? And soon after, the business start, you know, before that, when things were not going well, he was in every prayer meeting, every Sunday, and all the Bible studies. Then the business starts growing. Oh, pastor, praise the Lord. My business is flourishing. Now I can now drive a, you know, what's that? BMW. What does that mean? To me, it means bring mama to work, you know. And so, but, uh, they, and, and now, and now, he is seldom seen in church. And 
one time he comes to the pastor and you pastor i'm having a hard time lagi uh, giving my my uh, contribution if that person comes to me say okay I'll, I'll ask god to take away your wealth but this is what happens when you do not know what to do with the blessing of god that gets in the way that makes you self reliant amen now i want to point out also it is not just wealth that makes you self reliant you can be so talented you are self reliant right you can be so bright and you become self reliant it is what the blessings of god it is what you allow god's blessings to do to you that makes you look warm Anyway, you can still be rich, you can still be talented, and you can still be on fire for God. Amen? So, uh, with a sad note, Swindle writes about Laodicea. Christ's message to the seven churches in Asia um, come to a close with a tragic letter to a self-sufficient, self-righteous, self-serving church in Laodicea. In their inexhaustible wealth and independent spirit, the Laodiceans are severely rebuked by the one who knew them better than they knew themselves. In fact, the Lord didn't state a single word of condemnation as he, uh, a commendation as he delivered the stinging rep reproof. The church suffered from pervasive self-reliance and the result is hypocr hypocritical work. So you see, when you become self-reliant, when you become self-centered, when you become self-absorbed, when you become complacent, when you become you know, indifferent, there is nothing good that you will be able to do for God. Jesus will see it, and what you do is mechanical, forced, but not coming from the heart. That is why to Jesus it is yak. Angay ilua. Amen? And that is again my, emphasis, my, my point here. The point is not that Jesus is against rich people. You can ask my son in law Bart. He needs rich people to fund the project of Rancho Ni Cristo. Amen? But I guess the lukewarm heart of a rich person will not support anything like that. Amen? But how did the Laodicean church become lukewarm? Well, the problem is, like city, like church. As we would have noticed already from the previous churches, our Lord adapted His words to something significant about the city in which the assembly or church was located. The church in Laodicea assumed the character and attitude of the city. And therefore, like city, like church, indeed, practically everything in the letter reflects some aspect of the church located in that setting. You and I have noticed this, perhaps even experienced the attitude ourselves. When a person get rich, gets rich, he changes. Now, one of the things I appreciated about our gathering and the reunion, you know, I, this is 41 years later, we are now almost singing that song of the Beatles, When I Get Older, Losing My Hair, many years from now. <laughs> when I'm 64, I'm 62, okay? But when I look at them, you know, some, one of them is really, really, you know, uh, prosperous. He's the son of Julius Bake Shop. One of them was uh, our, our, our board top notcher, number two in chemical engineering. Ako igul ako ni Pasar. But when I look at them, they were still humble they did not even wear fancy clothes and that's the thing i like about my classmates no they did not change they are still they were in fact uh, uh my friend bobby uh the one who's the uh, all the son of julie's bake shop you know he drove us around housed us in his uh, in his uh, uh beach house and he, he did things for us you know but uh, you know on a more uh, 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 uh generally uh, when a person gets rich, he changes. He becomes proud and arrogant and forgets where he came from and thinks that he does not need anything or anyone. I like how Gordon Fee puts it. But as is often the case, it is all a matter of perspective. 
In this instance, there's vis-a-vis or face-to-face Christ. In other words, uh, Gordon Fee is saying, here we find in the book of Revelations the perspective of the Laodicean church themselves versus the observations of Jesus Christ himself. Now, who do you think is right? Jesus. The observation of Jesus. That is why it is very important for us to pursue the like of God, not the like from our friends. Amen? Things are so flippant in Facebook. Bisag dili anga ilike, like lang yapon. Amen, di ba? <laughs> okay. Um, Laodicea was known for its wealth and its manufacture of special eye salve as well as a glossy black wool cloth. It was also located near Hierapolis where there were famous hot springs and Colossae known for its pure cold water. By the time water from Hierapolis and Colossae got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm with heavy presence of sediment that also affected the quality of the water. It was disgusting. So arrogant was Laodicea about its wealth that when the emperor proposed to help rebuild the city along with other Asian cities destroyed by the earthquake in AD 60, Laodicea refused what we would call a federal disaster relief, relief funds. No? So the Laodicean Christians reflected the values of the prosperous society, boast, boasted, I am rich and wealthy. The city and the church were so wealthy, they considered God unnecessary. In reality, they were spiritually bankrupt. They had clothed themselves in fine apparel, but inwardly, they were naked of virtue and love for God. Though the city boasted of near miraculous eye salve, only Christ had the power to remove their pervasive spiritual blindness. And so, though worldly rich, well-dressed, and healthy, spiritually, they were poor, naked, and blind. And this ought to remind us of our role as the church. You are the salt of the earth, and if salt loses its flavor, how then shall it be seasoned? If it is good only, it is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. So, rather than like city, like church, God wants it the other way around. Like church, like city. Amen? We should influence society and not let society or the city influence us. So we go to the response and admonition of Christ. Revelation chapter 3 uh, verses 18 to 19. I counsel you to buy from me gold uh, refined in the fire that you may be rich and white, and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So what was the response to the wretched condition of the Laodicean church when they fa- uh, which they failed to recognize? As the amen, the faithful and true witness, our Lord Jesus spoke the truth and held nothing back in honest assessment of the church. Yet the source and the ruler of God's creation, he offered the Laodiceans the possibility of turning things around. It was not too late. You know, the good thing about God is when we make mistakes, when we're going away, you know, he still pursues us. Right? I was just sharing with the man yesterday in here. You know, I wish that this place would be full, uh, we would be filled with men. Guys, we need you. We want you here. We, we want to have a, a vibrant men's fellowship in this church. No? But I told them, listen, to get a rebuke is not something that we should dislike. Okay? Ayaw mo kalain if people rebuke you. Now, please, do not assume that you have the ministry of rebuke. Okay? <laughs> I don't find that in the Bible. <laughs> but listen to people that are close to you. Now, I listen more to my friends 
to those that I am closely associated with. Why? Because I know that if he's a friend, what he says, even if he badlongs me, no? even if he rebukes me, I know that it is for good. Can I talk to some of the young people here? Who are young people here? What, ba? Oi, tanan sila, nangisag kamot. But if you're a teenager, you're a son or a daughter here, listen to your parents. Badlungon ganit mo, ayaw kasuko. Ayaw pang luod, ayaw bundak-bundak, o ayaw sulod sa kwarto, o pang lak. Okay? Why? Because your parents, when they correct you, they only mean the best for you. You see, as parents, we already made the mistakes. We don't want you to make the same mistakes. It's a loss of time and it's painful at times. Right? So rebukes and correction are not bad. They are good. And when they come from your pastor, your elders, or your leaders, or a close friend, listen. Amen? Listen. Listen to what the Spirit says to the churches, right? And so... Um, God was still, uh, Jesus was still offering. He was not really angry with the Laodicean church. Kita patusukot na takayo, no? Robert H. Mounds uh, co comments on this passage, the smog satisfaction of the Laodiceans is countered with the advice that they make purchases in those specific areas in, in which they were confident uh, that, that no need exists, No? Since they are poor, they needed to buy gold refined in fire so that they may become rich. So they, gold was familiar to them, but Jesus said, you need my gold. Not the physical money gold, but you need the virtues that come from me. Amen? The gold is the spiritual wealth that has passed the refiner's fire and has been found to be totally trustworthy. The Laodiceans need white clothes as well in order to cover the shame of their nakedness. A contrast with the black woolen fabric in which the city was famous, and was famous for. Yeah, they were famous for a black fabric. Jesus said, you need white, uh, white robes from me. Amen? And uh, of course, uh, 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 white clothes are symbolic of righteousness, and uh, in the book of uh, Revelation, uh, in the Bible, in the Bible world, nakedness was a symbol of judgment, actually, and humiliation. Now, I'm, I'm reading through the Bible. I'm now in the, in, the, in, in the book of Isaiah. And for three and a half years, God told Isaiah, walk through the streets naked. Can you imagine that? Naked because God was trying to, uh, uh, the message of uh, Isaiah was that, Egypt would be conquered by the Assyrians and what they would do to those people that they conquered, they would strip them, humiliate them, bind, bind them in, in, in chains and then you know, uh, drag them to their, to, their, uh, to their country. So nakedness was a symbol of humiliation and judgment. Okay? Um, at the same time, to receive fine clothing was an indication of honor. Remember? Joseph being honored by Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 41 and 42 and Mordecai by, by King Ahasuerus in, in, in uh, Esther chapter 6 verses 6 to 11. Thus in God's sight and certainly not ours, the Laodiceans were walking about spiritually naked, not understanding their humiliation and needing the white robes of righteousness that could be purchased at no cost except the acknowledgement of their sh uh, shameful condition. The immediate cause of their problem was their spiritual blindness. Laodicea was, uh, was known for its uh, famous medical school and exported the Phrygian powder, widely used as an eye salve. Confident of their vision into spiritual matters, the Laodiceans needed as where it were their own eye salve to restore their Eyesight. We are reminded of Jesus' dictum. For judgment I have come into the world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be blind. John 9.39 Jesus now says, Recognize your blindness or there is no hope 
of healing. So, Chuck Swindoll summarizes Christ's admonition. First, Jesus gave them a serious advice that can be summed up in a straightforward command. Stop trusting yourselves. Turn to me. In place of dependence or worldly wealth the, uh, that brought poverty, Christ offered true spiritual riches. In place of relying on their own outward appearance that left them spiritually naked, Christ offered to clothe them in his own righteousness. Instead of a physical salve to heal uh, blurred eyes, uh, Jesus offered spiritual eye salve to cure the cat cataracts on their character. Second, Christ assured them of his love. Though he rebuked the Laodiceans with severity, he added words of tough love. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So when God corrects us, it's because he loves us. Parents, when, when children, children, when parents correct you, it's because they love you. They want you to succeed. Uh, my son, my, my first, uh, I, have, I, have, I have three children. I have I have Chichi and then Jinky here. But my first son, Michael, we didn't see eye to eye when he was in high school. You know, it's, it's like Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, when I was seven, I thought my father knew everything. When I turned 14, I thought he knew nothing. When I turned 21, I was surprised at how much he had, he had learned in seven years. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, you know, he didn't study in high school. Then, after one year of college, he joins the Navy. Three years into the Navy, I get a call from Okinawa. And this time, my son had a different tone. You know, Dad, Mom, you're the best parents in the world. You go, hui. <laughs> Amen. I salamat. But before, he did not like to listen to me. Amen. So because we love our children, we, the people that we love, we correct. Of course, listen. If you listen right away, the volume will not be increased, right? Okay, dong, dong, you know, sakto na ng Facebook, dong. Yung wala na ng tingog. Pero di pa ganunin mo, dong, sakto na ng tingog. But if you still don't listen, then the volume will increase. Dong lagi. I knew that I was in trouble when I think my mother called me by my first name rather than by my nickname. Okay? So don't let them do that. So, uh, the Laodiceans were steeped in self-reliance. They shamelessly trusted in themselves, their riches, and their own strength. Yet, out of fatherly love for his children, Christ presented a clear solution. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And that is why you get to that famous line, Behold, I stand at the door, at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. No? We often use this for evangelistic or witnessing, but this actually refers to those who are already in church. Of course, you can still use it there. But you know here, this line says, there is something wrong with the picture when it is Jesus, who is supposed to be the head of the church, has to knock and ask himself to come in. Okay? But you know what? Jesus still calls on the Laodiceans and he still calls on us today. Because God saved us, Jesus saved us so that we can fellowship with Him. So that we can have intimacy with Him. You know, He did not just save us to escape the fires of hell. Hello? Did you get married to your wife so you can still see other ladies? No. Right? When you get married, you sing the song, I only have eyes for you. Okay? Okay? <laughs> so Jesus wants that fellowship and he still offers it to them behold I stand at the door and knock I still want to come in and have fellowship with you amen but the real problem with the church of Laodicea was that they didn't even realize that they have a problem that is the big problem when you don't know that you have a problem okay so let us therefore take some, some time to examine our true spiritual conditions. Uh, let, in cry, let, let this message you know, penetrate in the hearts. The church is here today. We're generally vibrant. Hey, how many of you understand that the church in Ephesus was the first church that Jesus evaluated 
and they had do they were doing everything good but Jesus said you are doing good in everything except that you have lost your first love and today you do not see anymore the church church in Ephesus but if you look at the history that was a rich church one of the pastors of the church was John the beloved himself and Timothy was there and Onesimus was there you, you talk about the spiritual teachers and, 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 and uh, great men of God at that time, they were in that. But yet, what happened? Now, you don't have the church in Ephesus. And that is why we need to listen to this. Because you, uh, you and I can be individually, we can be high and hot for God. But yet, if we don't watch it, we may allow things in our lives so that we become lukewarm towards God. Now, generally, this church... I like coming here. I get refreshed because of the vibrancy of your worship. But let it not stay here. Let the vibrancy of your worship to God be expressed in your relationship with your wife, your husband, your children, and how you behave outside of the four walls of this sanctuary. Amen? You could be hot here, but how are you outside? Amen? Are you, is the hotness, does the hot water here lose its temperature when you get to your home? Amen. So let, let, us, uh, let us consider this, okay? We can drift from hot to lukewarm if we're not careful because of the conditions of the world around us. There are so many things that pull us away from God. There are so many temptations. And our pursuit to, to do well in life, that can cause us to be lukewarm. Amen. Now, secondly, there are always individuals in the church who may be going through the motion of being in church, yet who are lukewarm. There are also those who are complacent, indifferent, just contented in their spiritual lethargy and are not involved in ministry, efforts, and training in the church. Be careful, you may be lukewarm. Amen? And so, the Christians in, I'd like for us to assume the attitudes of the Christians in Philadelphia who became broken by their exclusion from their synagogues, you know. And uh, you know, as Craig Keener puts it, uh, that the Christians in Philadelphia had little power, counts in their favor before God. Power is easily abused, but weakness often leads us to dependence on the power of God, you know. Let us not be self-sufficient. Even when you're prospering, even when you're doing well, Keep yourself dependent on God. Now, one of the things I pray for every morning or uh, in, in, during the course of days, I say, God, I need you. I need you. Now, we must always need God. Amen? And, uh, you know, Jesus encouraged the church in Smyrna, saying in chapter 2, verse 9, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. So they were, they were in poverty because they were persecuted. If you are in a place where there's persecution, people will not buy from your stores. You could not even maybe perhaps find a job. But they stuck to their faith. And Jesus said, no, people may think that you're poor, but to, my, to me, you are rich. Amen. Amen. Quite the opposite of Laodicea. Anybody who is lukewarm, one who is soaked in self-reliance, reliant, self-centered, and independent, cannot give God the true worship he deserves. After the evaluation of the Laodicean church, we get a glimpse of the heavenly scene. So chapter 2 and chapter 3, you get the churches. But in chapter 4, in Revelation, you get a, a glimpse of what it's like in heaven. Where the elders, the 24 elders cast their crowns before the throne of God. And the four living creatures with six wings always cried, holy, holy. And they cried out in chapter 4 verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. That is the heart of a worshiper. That is the heart of a man or a woman that says, I need you, God. I am not self-reliant. I am not lukewarm. Amen? And so, folks, my dear folks, I would just like to encourage all of you, if you're hot today, remain hot. Do not allow anything to. Now, if you go to Leviticus chapter 6, the phrase is repeated three times in six verses. 
The fire on the altar must be kept burning. Let it never go out. Amen? Keep fanning the flames. If you're lukewarm or if you're cold, admit it to God and just go back to God and let Him, you know, every now and then we need God to allow God to evaluate ourselves. Amen? I remember uh, we had a, a couple of missionaries uh, many years back when I was a new Christian. And one of them was already in their mid-60s. And he said, every time I go around and I see an empty lot, I know that my heart is still right with God. When in that lot, I see a church. I imagine a church building. So he, wherever he will go, he said, that is how he evaluated himself or, you know, one of his signs that he was still doing okay with God because whenever he sees an empty lot, he dreams that there would be a church there. So when he goes around and he does not do that anymore, he says, it's time for me to go to the altar. Amen? It's time for us. In my, in my own way, you know, if I have been busy the whole day and I have one hour left, at the end of the day, I have two choices. To watch TV or to spend the time reading the Bible. If that thing starts to cool down, I know I need to go to the altar of God. You know? So let us today here allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Let him have, let, uh, spend time with God. Let him assess us. You know? It is good for us. And I pray that you and I will always be like the Philadelphian church and the Smyrna church. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you all.